Imagine for a moment that we are sitting in the gallery of a divine courtroom watching the proceedings. It's roughly 700 years before Christ when this tribunal has been convened, and the people of Israel are behind the defense table, waiting to hear the accusation being brought against them. And standing at the table reserved for the prosecution is God. The prophet Micah, acting in combined roles as bailiff and maybe even moderator and judge and court reporter, calls the whole thing to order. He invites God to plead God's case against the people. And it isn't just these three parties and those of us looking on that are present either. All of creation has been galled to these proceedings. The mountains and the hills, the very foundations of the earth, serve as witnesses and maybe even jury to pass judgment on the entire ordeal. God stands to address the court and specifically to call Israel to the witness stand. The matter in question is the people's unfaithfulness, their disregard for the covenant with God, and their unwillingness to live in the ways God desires them to. Earlier in the writings of the prophet, God has already outlined the specifics of the charge. The powerful are greedy. It says they covet fields and seize them, houses and take them away. They are violent, particularly against the poor. There is corruption in their midst, and their political leaders take bribes. Even the religious leaders sell out for money instead of appropriately leading the people to serve God. So God asks quite bluntly, What have I done to you? What have I done to deserve this kind of treatment? What is it that God did to cause the people to act toward God in the ways that they have? Just like we heard from the prophet Isaiah last week, God doesn't even wait for an answer at that point. He simply recounts through the prophet many of the wondrous, faithful, and redemptive acts God has done for the people. There's most notably the liberation from Egypt. And when the people needed God, when they cried out for liberation, God showed up and sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to lead them. God goes on to remind them of the time when King Balak of Moab wanted to work a curse against the people through Balaam, son of Beor. But God turned that curse into a blessing right before they entered the promised land. And then there's the reminder of what happened as the people crossed over the Jordan from Shittim to Gilgal to be given the promised land. These are saving acts of the Lord, it says, but in response to them, the people have acted in rebellion. They've forgotten their story and their covenant. At this point in the proceedings, a response is required from the defendant. And Israel's answer comes in the form of a question. You would remember it in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, when they ask, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now, it's hard to get a tone just by reading words off of a page. That's the problem when you get text messages and emails, isn't it? You can't read the tone behind the other person's message. Even with different emojis or gifts to give you some context, there's always a little bit of interpretation and guesswork that goes into it. Since we're not literally sitting in the divine courtroom, and we cannot hear the words out of Israel's mouth, we have to do a bit of guessing here. But I honestly find it hard to imagine this question coming from a very genuine place. I hear it almost as an exasperated response to God's lists of saving acts. It's almost as if they recognize there is literally nothing that they could ever do that would actually level the playing field and repay God for what God has done for them, and they seem to resent it. There's a great deal of hyperbole here as this list of possible offerings gets larger and larger as it goes on. Would burnt offerings do it? Would expensive plates of veal do the trick? Would that fill God's stomach and make God happy? What if we rounded up all the rams we could find and sacrificed them to God? Well, rams aren't good enough? Well, how about all of the precious olive oil our land could possibly produce? We won't keep any of it for ourselves. God can have it all. Would the debt be paid then? No? Well, fine. We don't practice child sacrifice like so many pagan people did in ancient times. That's forbidden, and God passed over our firstborn children in the Exodus. 
But what if we sacrificed the most precious thing we could possibly imagine? What if we actually sacrificed the fruit of our bodies, our children? Would God be happy then? Would that please God enough to consider our debts paid? Now imagine in this moment, God with an incredibly pained look across the divine face, and the mountains and hills and the foundations of the earth looking on in dismay. Israel clearly doesn't get it. God has been faithful to God's part of the covenant, but the people have not. Their focus is, in fact, in the wrong place. Each of their suggested, albeit disingenuous, offerings was set in the midst of temple worship. They thought that their part of the covenant could be settled by simply coming to worship and offering some type of gift that had a value to it. But their understanding of what God expected was way off. God desires more than empty words and temporary gestures. It's ongoing faithfulness, like the faithfulness that God offers us. At this point, Micah speaks up again. It would be unorthodox in an actual court proceeding, perhaps, but it seems almost as though God is just too pained to speak. So in Micah 6, 8, the prophet speaks words that go right to the heart of what God requires. If you have ever searched for the will of God, hoping to at least get a general sense of what God wants us to do in this life, here it is. If we have ever wanted to know what it means not just to accept Christ as Lord, but to actually, quote, you know, get right and live right with God, well, the prophet offers it for us. He says, quote, God has told you, O mortal, what is good. In other words, you know the answer. It was set before you when the covenant was made and has been passed down through the generations, through the law and the teachings. He says to them, And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. That's it. The message says it this way, But God has already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women, it's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. In the most basic sense, that is what a faithful life looks like. If we wanted to move from embracing the principles within the greatest commandments of loving God and neighbor and actually live them out in practical ways, or even if we wanted to move from the idea of the mission of the great commandment and the abstract vision of the kingdom of God toward which we are always working, and we wanted to lay out the plan for how we would get there, well, there it is. If we find ourselves even like today in times of crisis and don't necessarily know how to respond, these things are what are essential and will help us thrive. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. It isn't about how many times you go to church, although selfishly, of course, as a pastor, I always want you to make it your first priority, and I specifically want you to be with us every time we gather. It isn't about how many scripture passages you memorize, or if you can say with full integrity that you do your daily devotion quiet time with the scriptures every day, although, of course, committing to daily practices of scripture reading so that it sinks into the depths of your soul and guides all that you do is important. It isn't even about whether or not you pray first thing in the morning, before you go to bed, and before every meal. Although praying without ceasing and staying in constant communion with God may be part of walking humbly. It isn't even about how much more money you give to the ministries of the church and its missional partners, although we can always give more. And financial faithfulness and good stewardship of the resources God has given us could definitely be part of doing justice and loving kindness. But it just isn't about the checklist. Isn't it? it isn't about the one-off syllabus-type requirements that we can do to get a passing grade and move on. Dare I say, it especially isn't about just having enough faith to say a prayer, to punch your ticket to heaven, and then go on living your life as if nothing ever happened. As one commentator wrote, God desires more than empty words. God desires justice that is measured by how well the most vulnerable fare in our community, a loyal love that is commensurate with the kind of love that God has shown toward Israel, and a careful walking in one's ethical life. 
On the one hand, this is good news. God doesn't put a price on our obligation. There isn't an offering that we could ever give that would please God enough to earn our way into God's pleasure. That's where grace comes in. God simply expects us to live. On the other hand, the way God expects us to live in response to God's work in our lives and in the world really requires all of us. It's almost as if Jesus himself took these principles and expanded them, at least in great detail, in the Sermon on the Mount, which has been the focus of our midweek messages lately. Blessed are the poor and the meek and the persecuted for righteousness' sake. They know what it means to walk humbly with God, to seek God's kingdom first, and store up their treasures in heaven. Temple worship is only one part of it, and it may not even be the most important part. So if you find yourself about to offer a sacrifice, and you remember that your brother has a grudge against you, leave your offering there and go and be reconciled to your brother. And only then will you be able to have a clear conscience and a heart that can fully worship. Now, avoid things like murdering, robbing, and adultery. That will help you stay inside the law. But unless you avoid things like anger, coveting, and lusting that cause you to see people as objects instead of being fully made in the divine image, you will never be able to act with justice toward others. From the standpoint of faith, justice is identified with the very nature of God. Justice transforms us. It enables us to restore communities, especially those that have been broken. It balances the personal good with the good for all. It is also something that people of faith must work toward. It isn't enough to wish and pray for it. It isn't enough to speak of it in a pledge. It isn't enough to sit back and complain because some people don't have it. Do justice, God says to the prophet Micah. Get out there and make it happen. God wants us to work on behalf of the powerless. Think of Christ's inaugural sermon in the synagogue in Nazareth, where he said he came to proclaim good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to declare the year of the Lord's favor. Or in Matthew 25, when he said that what we do to those whom society deems the last, the lost, and the least, those who are poor and hungry and thirsty and naked, the homeless, those unjustly persecuted and imprisoned, we do to God. Justice like this rights wrong and leads to a reversal of fortunes in either this life or the next. Like when Jesus talks about the last being first and the first being last. is the kind of lived out faith that Pope Francis talked about when he said, you pray for the hungry and then you go and feed them. That's how prayer works. It's also the kind of faith that names society's greatest sins, repents of the parts we have played in making them systemic, and then takes to the streets or writes and calls elected leaders who votes to make sure the world is made better and that the dream of our land is more than economic prosperity and the ability to consume and be entertained so that we can distract ourselves from our greatest problems. It is actually about liberty and justice and, in Christ's terms, abundant life for all people, including and especially those who are overlooked, under-resourced, and exploited because all people are children of God. Do justice, God says. It brings balance, restores relationships, and takes an unfair life and makes it fair. It's a reflection of the Hebrew concept of shalom. It leads to peace that surpasses understanding for the entire world. But we can't just wait around for God to make it so. It is actually the responsibility of people of faith to work to make it happen. Love kindness, God says to the prophet. It comes from the Hebrew word hesed. It has to do with love, loyalty, and faithfulness. It is what you would ideally find between, in relationships with married people and between people and God in covenant. It isn't about following God's ways out of fear of punishment. God doesn't want fear as we understand it. God wants faithful covenant partners. God wants love and faithfulness and reverence and devotion. And God wants us to act toward others with that same kind of loving kindness, we call it, that God offers to us through Christ. It doesn't have to be much. 
It can be small acts of kindness. But we should strive to be so kind that we fall in love with kindness. We should try to be so merciful toward others that we fall in love with mercy. We don't just do acts of service. We fall in love with serving others because we are in love with God. And anyone who is in a covenantal relationship will tell you that love takes work. And this is no different. We have to choose to love kindness over and over again until acts of kindness flow naturally from us because that love shapes everything that we do. Great preacher Fred Craddock tells the story that one time when he was teaching at a seminary in Oklahoma, the semester had ended and he and his wife were taking a much needed break to his native Tennessee. They were staying in Gatlinburg apparently and they were enjoying a nice meal at a wonderful restaurant. Suddenly, they noticed an older gentleman that entered the restaurant and seemed to be working the room a bit. He was going from table to table, chatting it up with people. Of course, he made his way toward Craddock and his wife. Craddock couldn't believe it. He was looking for a break from people. He was enjoying a nice meal. Even more than that, he was enjoying some personal time with his wife. And here comes this stranger to spoil it. The man came up to the table asked how they were doing and where they were from. And then he asked what Craddock did for a living. So trying to be sly and perhaps confuse the man to the point where he would move on, Craddock said he taught homiletics, which is just a technical and fancy way of talking about the art of preaching. The man's eyes widened and he said, Oh, you teach preaching. I've got a preacher story for you. Craddock had heard more preacher stories than he ever wanted to in his life, but the man wasn't going to be stopped. He even sat down at the chair at the table with them. The man said that he was born not far from that restaurant, just on the other side of the mountains. He said, my mother wasn't married when she had me, and the shame that fell on her fell upon me. People would see us coming down the street, and they would cover their mouths and talk to each other. But we knew what they were saying. It got so bad, he said, that in school the other boys had a name that they would call me that I hadn't heard until I heard it from them. And I'm sure they had heard it from their parents, probably about me. He said, we didn't go to church much as a family when I was growing up. We were worried that the church folk would look at us and ask things like, what is trash like you doing in a holy place like this? Then a new preacher came to town, so we went to hear him. Whenever we went, we would sit in the back of the church so that we could get out as soon as the sermon was finished. One Sunday, he said, I was so enthralled with the sermon that I actually lost track of what was happening. The service ended, and as I tried to rush to the back and out the door, a line had already formed in the aisle and I was stuck. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned around and saw that it was the preacher looking down at me with his piercing blue eyes. He looked at me and asked, Son, whose boy are you? Who is your daddy? And the man said, My lip began to quiver and tears started to well up in my eyes. That was the question that had haunted me my whole life. And here he was asking me. But a moment later, the preacher said, Wait a minute. You don't have to tell me. I know who you are. You are a child of God. God is your father. Son, you may not know it, but you have a great heritage. I want you to go out into the world, and I want you to claim it. The man sitting with Craddock and his wife said, I don't mean to be overly dramatic. But those two phrases, you are a child of God and God is your father, were the two most incredible things that had ever been said to me. And very frankly, they changed the whole course of my life. Now, as the story goes, by this time, even Craddock was enthralled. And he asked what the man said his name was. He said, my name is Ben Hooper. And Craddock said that suddenly he remembered the words of his own grandfather, who had told him that twice in its history, the state of Tennessee had elected as governor 
a man who had been born out of wedlock, and that was Ben Hooper, who recognized a new sense of himself through the grace of God and the kindness that was shown to him by others, especially by this one man who helped him understand his identity as a child of God. It wasn't much, just a single interaction, but it was a kindness that comes straight from the heart of God and that has the power to change the trajectory of someone's life. Love kindness, God says. Finally, we must walk humbly with God. It is an idea that springs back to the way the images of the Garden of Eden are told in the book of Genesis. That in the beginning, when God created human beings, God's desire for us was that we would be in intimate relationship with God throughout the entire journey of life, epitomized in the idea of Adam and Eve walking with God in the cool of the day. It's living in constant communion with God and out of reverence for God. It reminds us that even in our darkest and loneliest times, God is always with us. The God who created us, redeemed us, gave us the breath of life, and welcomes us home at our death is with us to sustain us every step of life's journey. Again, on the one hand, this is hopeful and easy because we don't have to worry about a checklist or fulfilling a series of requirements in order to be in right relationship with God. Grace has us covered. On the other hand, it is extremely challenging because the relationship with God requires all of who we are. It requires our whole life. It requires us to give each day to God and to live each day for God's kingdom and for the good of those around us. It is the daily work to live in response to God's grace and in reflection of the nature of the God who has done so much for us. In this liminal space and time in which we find ourselves, in that space and time where we recognize that we've left something old and we are waiting to see what emerges on the other side of this entire pandemic ordeal, we may wonder what God requires of us right now. Well, in any time, the requirements remain the same, and living them out may be all the more urgent now because it is how people of faith respond in moments like these that shape the way that people are able to survive or thrive in the midst of challenge and chaos. As we wait in the meantime for whatever is next, now more than ever, because of what God has done for you through Christ, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Amen.